depth, we continue to find out what makes an elite Olympian. Our sports scientists shine a precision spotlight on cycling. It's an extremely complicated interaction, really, between man, machine, and his environment. And the challenge that we have as biomechanists and scientists is to try and really optimize the different interfaces that we have between the human and the bike, but also between the bike and the environment. In track cycling, it's a matter of generating very high amounts of power very quickly. And so our track cyclists are big, very powerful, muscular athletes. They do a lot of um, very quick, high intensity work, which needs fuel from carbohydrate but they also need to be able to recover and mend the damage that those kinds of sessions do by having good protein recovery afterwards. Physiologically, when you get the bike off the line, we talk about inertia, the amount of power needed to move something into space. And it does take a big, strong, powerful burst of activity, predominantly from the fast twitch muscle fibers to get that bike moving. All the joints of the lower extremity are extremely important. You'll see cyclists have extremely well-developed gluteals, also extremely developed quads and also extremely developed calves. And we want to try and translate as much of our muscle contraction into propulsive energy along the bike as we possibly can. So we tend to try and minimise upper body movement, but also to try and maximise force production on every pedal revolution. Cycling's a key example of when goal setting would be really useful. The athletes are working as part of a team. They're working on the tiniest of margins, so they need to be able to monitor and measure each improvement that they're making. We like to test out their total amount of power in watts. So what we do is we do something called the Wingate Anaerobic Test. And what that test does is a 30 second all out test where they're pedaling against a specific resistance and we actually can see how much total power that they have and how fatigue resistant their body is. So within that 30 seconds, we'll see a quick peak in strength, but we like to see fatigue slowly go down. We don't want to see a shot down or big spike down. So that's what we look for and over time we train that. There's a big difference to the endurance cyclists. They have less muscle mass on their body. Their legs don't have to be as big and thick. Road cyclists are another great team to work with in terms of nutrition because there's so much opportunity and need for them to fuel during their long cycling races. And they'll be the days that it's more important to have the feed bags or the power gels and the sports drinks to provide carbohydrate and fluid to replace and replenish fuel and fluid over the course of that stage. From a biomechanical point of view, we're trying to maintain a good profile and a good position on the bike. This will mean trying to reduce wind resistance that's going to slow us down during our pedal stroke. So optimising our position in terms of our seating, and our hand and our arm positions to try and reduce the overall frontal profile surface area, this should help our efficiency. One of the, the interesting things about the culture of cycling is it's done as a team sport. There's generally some protected riders, the riders that you hope are going to win the race. They're in the slipstream of other riders and so they're not quite doing the same workload as the guys at the front, saving their fuel, saving their ability to be able to get to the finish line first. <laughs>